Good morning. My name is Rabbi Chaim Dov Beliak. Um, I'm the volunteer executive director of Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland. And it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to a joint program that is uh, conducted by Beit Polska, the progressive movement in uh, Poland, um, and uh, Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland. Uh, we're very privileged to have a, a scholar from the University of Warsaw, who I will shortly introduce. I want to help uh, orient everyone to our uh, technical difficulties or challenges, um, and that is that at the bottom of your screen, uh, you will see a button that says interpret interpret interpretation and you you should choose the language that you want to hear um uh professor ronen will be speaking in uh english um but uh it will she will be simultaneously uh interpreted by marek yuzowski and then marjana shimanska uh in into polish so that uh, will allow you to hear uh, the uh, lecture um, in the language that you're most comfortable uh, with. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, welcome everyone uh, from uh, the various places that are uh, joining us uh, and um, uh, remark that uh, uh, this is uh, the 32nd program in our series. And uh, I'll be announcing at the end uh, two upcoming programs uh, for uh, February and uh, March. Uh, so now let us turn to Professor uh, Ronen, um, who I consider to be uh, a great discovery. Uh, she teaches at the University of Warsaw uh, in the Hebrew Studies Department and was the uh, head of the department uh, from 2009 to 2021. Uh, she is the author of a wide variety of books, um, and I will not share all of them with you, but I want to focus on the book that uh, will be part of her presentation today uh, that came out in 2015, uh, uh, A Prophet of Consolation on the Threshold of Destruction, um, uh, Yoshua uh, Yosias Ton, An Intellectual Portrait. Um, and uh, this is a, a very significant figure, as uh, uh, Professor Onen will share with us. Um, uh, and she's written a number of other books in the area of Hebrew literature and philosophy. Um, and I want to just turn to uh, the fact that her interests are very wide. Um, recently, uh, I read a review of hers that was just excellent, uh, that she's probably forgotten about. Uh, about a novel called Poland, a Green Land uh, by Aharon Appelfeld. Um, uh, so it is a pleasure to welcome such a Renaissance uh, professor, um, and we're appreciative of her uh, participation today. And uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Ronin. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, to, to benevolence, I would say that if we talk about Renaissance persons, so my hero, uh, Ozia Ston, is the Renaissance person today, this evening. And also I would like to thank you for the invitation and also to say that for me it's very, um, it's an honor and also a pleasure because uh, uh, even though I'm, I consider myself as a con cultural Jew, I'm very much uh, uh, close to the progressive uh, movement on earth and and um, I would even say that uh, I had a very uh, stormy debate here in Poland on, on Gazeta Wyborcza about the, what should be, uh, what, how, how Judaism should look like in, in Poland. Um, very hot, I would say, debate. And... Then I thought that it's impossible for Polish Jews to accept uh, progressive reform Judaism. Uh, 
let's say that reform and progressive are more or less synonym. Not, I know not exactly, but more or less. And now when I see that uh, progressive Judaism is, exists in Poland, it's really uh, very, uh, very, makes me very happy. In any way, um, the common view of uh, Poland, Polish Jews is that uh, progressive Judaism uh, was not present because the image of Polish uh, Jews, Jewry is like all student. It means very traditional, uh, tend to Hasidism mostly, maybe also kind of orthodoxy. And uh, in that, um, and, and it's not the, 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 the whole truth. I mean, most of, uh, let's say, the, the religious Jews in Poland were very traditional, but there, there, were, there was a great presence of um, um, progressive Judaism, especially in Krakow and, and in Warsaw. I would, if I can mention a few for names like Isaac Tsilkov, who translated the Hebrew Bible into Polish, and I use this translation because I, 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 I think that in Polish is the the best translation for Jewish studies. But also, uh, Markus Jastow uh, from Krakow, uh, Simon uh, Donkiewicz, uh, Isaac Krimstak, and also others. And it was, of course. Um, a result of influence that came from uh, that came from Germany um, through the very close relation between between Jews in in Poland and in uh, uh, Germany, and also I would like to 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 add that in those days, I mean the end of the nineteenth century, the beginning of the twentieth century, mostly the progressive groups, progressive Jewish groups were. Uh, part of what is called intelligentsia. In any way, I will start first with some uh, biographic notes on uh, Ozzy Stone because he is not very well known. And then I will discuss his, I would say, concerns or uh, uh, his um, perception of uh, Judaism and Jews in Poland. Uh, mostly in the time between the two world wars. And also, before I would like to stress that everything that we tell about him, we must have in mind that he wrote all of this before the Holocaust. It's very important. The Holocaust is not a part of his awareness. It's not something that he even thought it, it's possible to, 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 to occur. And... Um, well, he, he died in 36, so, but he, this is a thing that was not existed in his, even in his worst nightmares. So we have to have it in mind because our perception after the Holocaust is completely different. And then we might think that some of his words are a bit, uh, let's say, naive. So he was a really central and important personality in modern Jewish history in Poland. Since the turn of the 20th century, he was an important figure for Krakow Jewry as a rabbi, a preacher, an educator. He was also a philosopher, a sociologist, a man of letters, a thinker, and a social leader. In interwar, in interwar Poland, he was an essential and significant person for the whole Jewish population as an intellectual, a publicist, a politician, a deputy to the Polish same, and a Zionist, theoretician, and activist. During his life and after his death, he was well known and was perceived as a central actor in the religious, intellectual, social, and politic political life of the Jews in Poland. However, after World War II, he was forgotten. No, that's why I wrote uh, the book about him because I believe that this fascinating uh, thinker should be rescued from obliv obliv oblivion. And uh, Tom was born in Lemberg, uh, today Lviv, in Polish Lviv, on February 13, 1870. At that time, the city was a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the capital of Galicia, it's important because the Austro-Hungarian Empire 
is known today for its, uh, let's say, multi uh, atmosphere, kind of tolerance that uh, in other places uh, like uh, the post-Russian uh, post, uh, parts of uh, Poland was not really known. I mean, so he also inherited a kind of pluralist uh, point of view and tolerance to others. He was uh, uh, born to a very poor uh, Orthodox family. His father, Moshe, was a rich traditional Jew, and he wanted his son to become an Orthodox rabbi. Don had to conceal from his father that he studied much more than Talmud. At home, he hid the secular books which he borrowed from friends because if his father found them, he would have turned them up. And when I say poor, it means cold, hunger, I think kind of poverty that we are not aware today. The books he had to borrow from friends, he could not offer to buy even one. He studied in Heder till the age of 10. He was such a brilliant pupil that when Melamed could not teach him anything more, he left the header and continued studying under the supervision of Rabbi Uri Zeev Wolf Salat, one of the most famous Jewish scholars in Vuv. Salat was the one to give Ton the first ordination as a rabbi when he was 16. It had a private character, but Ton always appreciated it much more than his formal ordination. Uh, in Berlin. He studied the humanities and the sciences in the spirit of the Haskalah in, in uh, Jewish Enlightenment in Galicia in Mikra Kodesh school. And in 1988, Ton and a couple of friends founded this association Zion. And from then until his death, he was a devoted Zionist activist. In 1891, he graduated from the German gymnasium in Lviv and moved to Berlin, where he began studying philosophy and sociology at the university. And he finished his doctorate dedicated to Kant's philosophy in 1895. During his stay in Berlin, he also studied at the Higher Institute for Jewish Sciences, Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Studentums, and was ordained as a reform rabbi in 1897. It was remarkable that Don, who was born to a very traditional family, found the way to progressive Judaism, what is not easy till still in today's Poland. In, 19, uh, in uh, 1897, he removed to Krakow after he was offered to become a preacher at the Progressive Temple Synagogue. After two years, he was promoted to the position of rabbi of the synagogue and held this position, position until his death in 1936. In addition to his rabbinical activity, he also played a significant control in Zionist organizations, initiated many educational and social activities, and supported Jewish and Hebrew education. For example, he was one of the inspiration or initiators of the Tarbut chain of schools in Poland between the wars and was his first president. Ton was an original writer of literary essays, namely, uh, mainly in Hebrew, philosophical essays and ideological articles in Hebrew and German, and sermon in Polish. He was also a publicist who published passionate articles in the Jewish press in Hebrew, Yiddish, Polish, and German. He was one of the founders of the Jewish newspapers in Polish language, Novigenik. Uh, his popular and journalistic writing had the greatest impact since it reached a broad Jewish audience, which we cannot say about his, for example, Hebrew uh, articles and books. His most demanding position was as a representative in the Polish parliament, same for four terms. 1919, 1922, 1928, and 1930. He was elected to the first legislature same as the member of the General Zionist Party. In his first and third terms, he was the president of the Jewish Circle, a parliamentary club of Jewish same members. In his four terms in the Polish parliament, he adopted a 
pragmatic and conciliatory political style inspired at the last period of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In his policy, he sought to reach an ag agreement with the Polish government on reducing official anti-Semitism and recognizing the civil and national rights of Polish Jews. So after this short uh, presentation of this uh, really impressive uh, personage, I would like to move now to his what could be his religious uh, message, which is not only religious, and we will see that. So he was a great orator, an extraordinary preacher. These qualities made him a valued speaker, both as a preacher to the synagogue as a rabbi in many social and cultural activities, and as a politician. Surprisingly, after his death, it turned out that he wrote down all his uh, homilies, but the texts where have, uh, we have are only the outlines of the great performances in the synagogue. Ton was a spontaneous speaker who talked to the audience looking straight in the eyes while inventing his powerful, full of patterns, speeches, and sermons. The oral words during the services were born in the time of their delivery. They were verbal improvisations. And I had the luck to meet Professor Makevich from uh, Gelonian University a few years because, before he, his death. And he reminded, told me about, he was present when Ton had his uh, ceremonies at, at the synagogue. So exactly what I just, described his way of talking he told he talked uh, he told me about his uh, pathetic and very very um, powerful uh, ceremonies and then i i felt that i touch in history when i heard this uh, testimony uh, Tan's homilies are in the frame of the new pattern of Jewish sermons that was created by Reform Judaism in Germany and was adapted by Progressive Judaism in Poland. His homilies were not like the traditional drasha. They were delivered in Polish, very important, were part of the service and expressed ideas suitable for their time. Moreover, this philosophical his philosophical training was rather present in his sermons, as well as his love for Hebrew, Polish, and German literature. Most of the homilies were delivered on holidays and had similar pattern. In almost all of them, he started with biblical event and then turned, turned to the contemporary era. The biblical event, for example, Exodus, was an allegory for the present situation of the Jews. He believed that he and his congregation could learn from the past and find their encouragement for the present. Although the history of the Jews was full of distress and afflictions, the conclusion should be optimistic because the Jewish people always overcame the troubles and survived. In some of the sermons, Stone criticized the current situation of the Jews for their indifference towards their tradition, abandonment of it, and a lack of social solidarity and unity. However, he always saw in the traditional sources, in the text of the Bible, a foundation for consolation and inspiration. What kind of religious message did Ton deliver? The spirit of many of his homilies is full of joy of life, energy, and optimism. The homilies are saturated with encouragement and dignity. Ton tried to move his flock to feel self-respect and unique. He told them that they belong to a magnificent nation which had a distinctive and wonderful history. Ton aimed to make them feel confident for being Jews, and to believe that a wonderful future was waiting for them. The intention was to offer them affirmation in, in contrast to their complex everyday life as Jews among Gentiles in Krakow at the turn of the 20th century. The Jews, Tong declared, were a vivacious and courageous nation of warriors who had eternal ideals. ideals. 
He preached that they remember their past with love and attention and use it to build great power in the future. And it's, quote, a day will, it will come in which there will be no more dark nights, end of quote. Tony's powerful words of pathos in order to express a vision on consolation and deep hope. So this is the first motive in his uh, religious uh, uh, message, optimism, and not to forget the past, which is glorious. Ton asserted that in its origin, Judaism was a religious of uplift, which saw in the earthly world the whole and entire existence. There was no world, world to come or afterlife. A person had eternity of or art of the life in his offsprings and not in any kind of existence after death. The biblical theory of creation valued everything that was created as good. The voices of the negation of life in um, Judaism started to be heard in the time of Ecclesiastes and was much intensified after the destruction of the temple. During long years of living in the diaspora, Jews lost the art of affirming life and the world. Here I would say also some kind of nuance from Nietzsche in this way of thinking about Judaism, biblical Judaism. Also in the Ta Talmud, an affirmation of life cannot be found nor any other vital forces. This is Tom uh, idea, not mine. Only with late Kabbalah and early Hasidism did the Jewish frame of mind begin to change and return, return to its origins. And the highest peak of the art of affirming life reappeared among Jews with Zionism. Not only did Jews begin again understand themselves like in the ancient era as a collective and not only as individuals, but also the affirmation of life was directed toward the earthy world. In this sense, at the tone, Zionism was, was the return to Judaism in the full sense of the word. This comparison of Zionism intriguing, particularly that Zionism is considered to be a secular ideology. Zionism was a vital force which brought Jews back to an active role in the world and history. Zionism was a new religious form, a new Messianic style, which had led to salvation. And his, he was really a zealous Zionist. And when he says Zionism, he means Zionism. So when, if I will um, uh, say in, in my words, the word Zionism, it means Zionism in Ton's mind. Ton did not hesitate to name the Jewish nation the chosen people, the chosen people of religion. This small nation at the eastern end of the Mediterranean created eternal poetry and deep thought, a nation that looked like a nation of warriors but wrote on a on tablet of stone an impressive law, a nation of shepherds that taught humanity to know the knowledge of one God and with it revealed the profundity of true and great religion. The uniqueness of the Jews was expressed by the idea that they were chosen religio religiously, it means in, from the religion point of view, because they created and bestowed the world with the concept of a trans transcendent God. The historical facts were not important for Ton, but his goal was to encourage his flock and make them proud of their Jewishness. And this is very important. Another mo motive in his um, religious uh, message, be proud of who you are. And uh, when I say that his, the historical facts are not so important for him because we are, I mean, nowadays we know that the Jews were not the first to held some kind of monotheistic ideas, but strict monotheism for Tone was very important. Uh, Tone added that the existence of the people of Israel was the proof of being in the nation of the chosen, like the fire that purifies and refines metals, so afflictions and persecution purified the Jews. 
Those who renounced their belonging to the Jewish people were cowards and the weak who could not bear the suffering. However, those who suffered and continued to be a part of the Jewish people were the chosen, the courageous, and the powerful. The subtext of this homily is the tone told this congregation that the fact that they came to the service in the synagogue showed that they were brave and powerful. They had chosen to belong to the Jewish people and had not abandoned their group. This fact makes them to be chosen human beings and therefore unique. In such words, Tom tried to shape the, them into a solid community. In other homilies, he made use of the feelings of belonging and social ties to encourage his flock to solidarity for other social groups among the Jews. He promoted the idea of a social aid for the working class and the poor. So as we see, solidarity is also a very important motive in his message. Nevertheless, Don Ton was aware to the fact that the temple community was a community of assimilators who went through a deep process of acculturation. Therefore, he wanted to strengthen their ties to the Jewish tradition. They had to remember he preached their past and not to relinquish the treasure of their heritage, to be proud of it, to hold their heads high, to respect their Jewishness. He urged them to learn their history, their ancestral language, and their faith. The, the past was important for not only their moral in times of distress, but also the construction of hope for the future. Ton wanted to identify intensified the bond of his community with Jewish tradition because it was an ever never ending source of for glory and nobility. The means to achieve this goal was to underline the importance of Jewish education for the youngsters and about education I will talk in a moment. Uh, once trying to summarize the main ideas of Judaism, Ton noted the following postulates, strict and pure monotheism, Messianism, which taught the faith in the ethical development of a person until he could reach even a divine com complement, a completeness of absolute pacifism. This is a kind of version of the internal piece of Kant and optimism, the belief that life is the mission of human beings which they have to fulfill. So he wanted his congregation to feel that they are really unique and they have to be proud of themselves and their tradition. One of the highest ideals which Ton continually emphasized in his homilies was freedom. First and foremost, he praised national freedom, the desire for an independent, sovereign, national, ethnic existence. The two best occasions for preaching such ideas were Pesach and Hanukkah. What, what the Jews needed first, a certain tone, was a freedom of the spirit. Spiritual freedom was the necessary step to gaining national freedom. Furthermore, national freedom and national dignity were not in, the, in contrast to the will to be a part of humanity in general. Interconnection and unification of humanity was possible only when people were gathered in nations or societies, not as individuals. Freedom is the first and the highest ideal of every society and every human being. And Apart from freedom as a national freedom or collective freedom, he also he, uh, was adherent or under, underlined the idea of freedom of thought, which I think it's really essential. Uh, free thought was not a threat to religion, that's tone. The highest kind of free thought was the place where also true and deep religios religiosity were, and there, both lived in harmony. The revelation of God in our souls was possible only when there was a total freedom of the mind. Clearly, Tom saw no contradiction between religion and thought, between rationality and faith. In a sermon delivered on Pesach, Tom elaborated on the concept of freedom. 
described three kinds of freedom, social, which was the right to self-determination of individuals and nations, spiritual, which was the right for the flexibility of mind and thought without any prejudices and fixed frames of mind, and moral, which in tones perception was the right for self-realization. From this analysis, it was evident that for Tone, freedom was a spiritual category. Alas, Jews in his days did not have spiritual freedom because their way of thinking was captivated in superstitions and prejudice. As long as cognition and knowledge were perceived as a sin, Jews would not have the freedom of the mind, Tone said. In fact, the Jews would have freedom only when they left the narrow world of halakha and tradition. Jews had to free themselves from the spiritual ghetto in which they were captured and become modern. They should adopt the Enlightenment's categories of freedom of thought, abandon the ready-made frames of thinking which had lasted for centuries. These words were not only a criticism of Jewish orthodoxy, but also the habit of being passive in the sphere of social and political life. Ton, in, con in contrast to traditional Jewry, did not reject European culture. If he had lived in the Hellenic era, he would have been a Hellenistic Jew. In fact, more than a distinct acculturation, he criticized the cultural level of Jewish people. He felt at home in Europe, and European culture was his as well. His criticism was directed to superficiality of the Jewish encounter with Europe and not to the encounter itself. He wished to modernize Judaism with principles like reason, science, freedom of thought, and openness to other openness to other cultures. Nevertheless, forgetting their glorious past, the Jews would not be able to overcome the gloomy present in which contempt towards the Jews was so widespread. So we see in his uh, thought a very interesting mixture of modern present with the past. In a, I would say that in a way he tried to find between them both at the golden middle. Ton was aware of the fact that his flock was much closer to the German reforms than to the Eastern masculine, let alone orthodox, or orthodoxy. Therefore, he developed in his sermons in uh, concept of uh, Judaism that will be golden middle. After all, he knew perfectly well both worlds, the orthodoxy world of Lviv and the reform world of Berlin. Thus, his synth synthesis of Judaism and modernity was not revolutionary, but evolutionary. For Ton, religion was an organic body, and for that reason it grew, altered, and co corrected itself by its inner laws. The mistake of the reforms were of the kind of wanting to break the barrel while trying to keep the wine, specifically rejecting the Hebrew language, thinking that it would not harm the religion or giving up the practical uh, precepts and keeping the abstract ideas of religion. Ton argued, we need different progress. The decisive element for us is to conserve and maintain the whole. This progress can go only as far as our historical specificity and our different will be kept. Crossing this border will not be progress anymore. Well, so it's the kind of progress that hold tradition. However, he also rejected orthodoxy. Jewish orthodoxy was a new form, a reaction to reform Judaism. And if I quote him, he says, our ancestor could not imagine he ironized Thon, who knew that Orthodox claim of being the only original and authentic forum Judaism. Orthodoxy only had the aspiration of keeping the old form and rejecting any new one. Thon was also convinced that traditional Judaism had emerged had, as it emerged both in the rabbinic rabbinate of Western Europe and in Hasidism of his time was, was uh, fossilized. Judaism, the corpus of canonical books, books, religious thought, ethics, and learning 
All the, these were the spiritual possessions the Ton ancestors bequeathed to him and all other Jews thousands of years ago. And what should they do with it? The Jews should keep this treasure, but not as an unchangeable relict. On the contrary, he emphasized that the Jews should enlarge and this possession and add to it new treasures. Judaism, as it had developed in 2000 years of existence in the diaspora, was completely indifferent or completely different than the Judaism of the Second Temple. Judaism was a living organism. It was a vital force which was in constant change and adaptation. Ton, the sociologist, saw religion as a cultural phenomenon revealed by numerous spiritual and creative products, inventions and works of art, literature, literature and philosophy. The Jews created and acquired with their encounter with the other cultures. I think that this comprehensions of uh, Judaism has many, similar, has many similarities with, with the concept of Judaism as a civilization, which was developed by Ton's younger contemporary Mordechai Kaplan, although his philosophy was the fruit of American Judaism and not Polish. So Judaism always from the first, <laughs> first appearance adopted itself as something to the dominant culture and always tend to uh, build some new synthesis between Judaism and other cultures. So it's, let if, I mean, say even this is the nat nature of, of Judaism. Um, for Ton, Judaism was not merely a religion, but was a whole civilization, which was in constant evolution. Therefore, Judaism was on the one hand, a huge arc of cultural treasures, and on the other hand, it was a constant creative force, which was flexible enough to adjust itself to different historical and cultural conditions. So what could be the synthesis, the, the third way? Ton, the son of Wolf's Orthodox Judaism and disciple of Berlin's Reform Judaism, rejected them both although he also respected some aspects in these two ways. He also rejected the traditional pre-modern Eastern European Jewish life of the shtetl, what he called Judaism inside the walls of the metaphoric ghetto of the Jewish law. Thus, what was Ton's path to Judaism, for Judaism? Ton offered a third way, or golden mean, between the excess excessive reformation of the Jewish religion and the ultra-conservative fortification of orthodoxy. The golden mean for Tom was a kind of progress which did not give up the con connection to the past. The modernization of the Jew who was not afraid of religious, cultural and social changes and innovations, but who also did not stop being a Jew in his emotional and spiritual tie to the Jewish people. In his warm attitude to traditional beliefs and his Eastern uh, pride, let us say, even pride, esteem and pride in Jewish civilization. So now I come to education. The most important tool to realize this vision concern, concerning Judaism was education. One of the to uh, topics in his sermons frequently repeated was the need to deepen Jewish education. This was the means for creating among the children of his flock engagement and involvement in Jewish life. The only hope for the future would be a young generation which had a Jewish consciousness. Tom was convinced that the current Jewish education was too practical and poor. He doubted the value of any education for Jewish children that did not include Hebrew language and deny them knowledge of the beautiful and heroic history of the Jewish people. The future and the survival of the Jewish people depend on education the children to love and to cherish Judaism. Otherwise, assimilation was unavoidable. Yet, Ton argued, to make the younger generation love Judaism, one, one should make it attractive. 
It could not be too conservative or isolated from the external, very tempting world. Judaism should be re regenerated with the national element and the European culture. Synthesis of cultures is the core of Judaism. Ton had enough examples for Jewish history, for example, the interweaven of Jewish and Hellenistic culture in the philosophy of Philo, uh, Philo of Alexandria, or Jewish um, and Muslim culture in the philosophy of Maimonides, or modern Hebrew literature, with, uh, which combines Judaism with uh, European modernism, also philosophy, for example, of mm, Herman Cohen and Kantian thinking or philosophy of uh, Abraham um, uh, Joshua Heschel and existentialism. I think in a way it happens also in America today, creating Judaism in the light with the dominant culture, but perhaps it's a bit different because the state is an immigrant country, a country of immigrants. But this is a, a point for discussion. Uh, so Judaism from its very beginning entered into symbiotic relationship with the dominant culture. That was Ton's idea. Ton was not afraid of pathos and ornamented words, especially in his homilies, in which he believed should serve to encourage and console. Being a preacher was similar to being an actor in the theater. Drama needed pathos, which was which was powerful, but did not disturb the audience. Ton needed pathos, especially when he spoke against anti-Semitism, the programs in Russia, and later against the discrimin discriminatory laws of the Polish government against the Jews. So he, though he was optimistic in his mind, he was not uh, closing his eyes to the realistic um, surroundings or the political situation in Poland. Nevertheless, Ton was optimistic about the future of Polish Jewry. This is actually, I would say, it turned tur my heart when I'm saying it, that he saw this, that the Polish Jewry has such a, a huge uh, future in front of it. He was convinced that one of the main spiritual centers of Judaism would arise in Poland. The United States was the second place. His vision for, war for the Jews in Poland was that they were, at the same time, equal and different. Jews deserve equal civil rights, but also cultural and national autonomy. Uh, autonomy. He believes that the majority of Polish Jews, with the exception of the few who immigrated to Palestine, will continue to live in Poland and create a special synthesis of the two cultures. His proposal to be both national Jew and a Polish patriot should be seen as an authentic and original contribution uh, to national thought. And I will stop now because I think I used my time. So thank you. Shoshana, thank you very much, Professor Ronen. Uh, this is a very important um, uh, first opportunity to learn about uh, Rabbi Ton. Um, I know that we will um, now turn to questions, but I also want to tell you that uh, we will also be calling on you to tell us more. Um, uh, your uh, your book uh, on Ton and the subsequent writings um, tell us that there's um, volumes and volumes of um, interactions uh, uh, with Rabbi Ton and his uh, interlocutors that uh, you have uh, uh, yet to tell us about. So first of all, uh, let's turn to uh, questions. Um, I think you can see some of the questions in chat. Um, um, and um, uh, there's um, uh, a number of questions that are coming in also in Q&A. Um, and uh, so we'll start. Um, uh, the, I think... If you don't mind, I'm going to uh, ask Dominica to ask to uh, put forward the the question that came in in Polish uh, by uh, uh, Professor Arek Patalon. Um, I I don't know if you can see the question 
uh, in uh, Polish, uh, Shoshana. Um, So I will read the question. I will now switch to a Polish channel to read it and uh, you will hear a translation. So, okay. Uh, this is a question from uh, Dr. Mirosław Patalon. Uh, the, my question relates to Słupska city in which I live. Right before the Second World War, this was a German uh, stop between 1902 and 1936. The rabbi of the Jewish reform community was Max Joseph, a unique rabbi, because as one of very few, was also a Zionist, and so was Ozias Shton. I was quite interested to, under, to hear that Ozias Shton received his doctorate in philosophy in Berlin in 1895, and the same at the same time, two years later, Max Ton received his doctorate in the same University of Berlin. They must have known one another because doctorates in philosophy were not a massive um, uh, option. Yet these two were uh, reform and uh, Zionists. Have you ever encountered uh, any uh, information about cooperation between them, knowledge of one another? I would only add that Ton was born in uh, 1870, while uh, uh, Joseph uh, uh, Marx in 1868. Thank you. Well, I'm 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 so sorry, but in all my research, I never. Well, I must be frank because my research was was really published eight years ago. So it means that about ten years ago. Perhaps I, I encountered the, this name, but I don't I don't remember it. But in any way, what uh, I would like maybe maybe to say that this is a very common uh, biography of many uh, Jews from East Europe that lived to Berlin. Sometimes in uh, to other places in Germany, like Breslau, now Wroclaw in, uh, in 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 Poland, and to 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 get an education, to get a modern education that they couldn't get in their places. So uh, and, and it keep, kept on for other reasons also uh, in the time between the two world wars, but. Uh, I encountered with other names of people who keep, became rabbis, like um, um, Marcus Bra uh, Broda or Marcus Ehrenpreis, also his friends that he was studying with them in Berlin, uh, that came from Lemberg, Viv, from East Europe, and they found others uh, also. They were called uh, Poles in the Jewish community there. And there was also the Russians. Uh, so Eastern European Jews that really were fascinated also from uh, mm, the modern world that they could uh, study the culture and the way of thinking of the modern world in, that was Germany then. So it's a kind of typical uh, biography, but I'm sorry, I, I can't say anything about um, Max, what's his name? Max Joseph, sorry. Um, well, um, it's, I think it's fortuitous. You'll have an opportunity to connect with Arik um, uh, 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 Patalon. Um, we'll put you together to learn uh, about each other. Um, Max Joseph's um, work was uh, translated uh, from German into Hebrew uh, uh, five years ago. It was one of the projects that uh, uh, Friends of Jewish Renewal in Poland and Beit Polska facilitated. And um, so we're very uh, happy to make a shidduch uh, um, uh, with your Rabbi Ton. We have a question regarding uh, Rabbi Ton's um, attitude toward women. And... Um, we have an opportunity to actually have the people who ask these questions, ask them directly. So I'm hoping that Paul Litz is, Lips is still online, and I'm going to put him online and let him ask his question directly to you. 
I, I know Thon had a very interesting concept of women. For example, that women would be separate from men, but they would be on the upper level of the of the synagogue. But I haven't found any broader information in terms of how he looked at women, of Jewish women, in terms of what would their place be within the, the more intellectual Jewish community. Yes, uh, thank you for this question, because this is, I, I think, one of the uh, painful points in tone for me, uh, privately, let's say, because uh, I think that uh, concerning women, he was very traditionalist. He, he was not a feminist for, for sure, uh, because uh, whenever he turned to, in, to women in his uh, ceremonies, sermons, he usually... Uh, um uh, turned to them as mothers that should educate their children's children uh and uh, he, he, i don't he gave them much more a uh, um place of educators than intellectual uh, and public uh, figures uh also i can tell you he had a son and a daughter, and and although his daughter was really remarkably talented, he never thought of telling her that she can be a rabbi. And he actually sent her to a very good school in Krakow, but school of nuns, rabbi. <laughs> so uh, this was the best school for her to uh, receive um, European education, but 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 not Jewish. So was that the norm of society? Are we talking about someone who fits well into the time period that we're talking about? Or were there other Jewish leaders in Krakow who might have had different approaches to women? Shoshana, I don't well, know if you yeah, I heard the I I I heard the, the question. I, I can't answer it in detail because I never Worked on it, and I never uh, searched this question. What can I say that from knowing that if uh, Sarah Schneider, the the one who uh, established Bet Yaakov, was considered to be a great feminist, so it's completely different way of looking at women in our days. And uh, and I think that uh, concerning uh, the Jewish. The Jewish community, the Jewish religious community, no, no, no matter if it's progressive or orthodoxy, or uh, women were treated traditionally. Uh, if I can think of uh, important uh, women figures or essentials, so usually they are in the socialist pa socialist party. It means. Uh, far away from religion, not that they were not Jews, but but not religion Jews, religious Jews. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, we're going to uh, turn to um, a question that uh, is asked by uh, uh, David uh, Cater. Um, uh, I'll read it out in English. Um, uh, what was Ton's relationship to the early, oh, excuse me, the telling of, of Rabbi Ton uh, is totally new to me, so pardon the doubt, uh, uh, no doubt, the simple question that I will ask. Namely, am I correct in understanding that his Zionism had little uh, uh, to nothing to do with discrimination or, or anti-Semitism or even oppression, which played such a significant part of early Zionism? I'm thinking of Herzl, for example, the Dreyfus Affair, etc., but rather anchored in the earliest story of the Jewish people. If I am correct, did we have any? Did he have any followers going to Palestine, for example? Um, I'm sure you have um, um, a, yeah, a response to that. Thank you for this question. Yes, his Zionism is completely detached from anti-Semitism. It was not at all uh, some kind of reaction to, to anti-Semitism in uh, Europe or in uh, uh, Poland. 
uh, and he was emphasizing that deliberately that Zionism is is like the new that he he was actually in under the influence of uh, European nationalism this 1848 let's say the idea of nationalist states and so on and uh, he was uh, thinking what can be the new di uh, direction of Judaism to 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 develop into and because he he saw that the secularism is getting stronger so what can unite the Jews not the religious element but the national element because we know that in Judaism it's kind of mixed and no, no one can really tell how many how much of it is religion how much of it is nationality and what does it mean this nationality at all uh, so it is a complex uh, uh, question, but uh, the, the new wave of modern Judaism for him was Zionism as a new path of Judaism or returning to the roots, as he thought, to the mythological ancient uh, Hebrews. But it was not, and he was stressing, it was not consequences of anti-Semitism because it, it was a consequence of its own development from in, in inside. So, uh, and he, actually he was not uh, pleased to hear that Zionism is a kind of uh, reaction to, to, to anti-Semitism. Um, he, he became Zionist very early and he was uh, adolescent when he became Zionist, when he became active Zionist. And uh, I think this was the way for him to find a new path to Judaism. In a way, he was um, uh, the disciple of Ahad Am, if you know who he is. And that uh, uh, Zionist, but from Zionist as not political, uh, but you know, social, but Zionism as a cultural, spiritual movement. Thank um, you for this answer. We are also having a question from Brian Zakem. Actually, there are two questions from him. Uh, first of them is, what percentage of all Polish Jews were affiliated or identified with Reform Judaism? Uh, and the second question following this one is, who attempted to interact with the active different streams of Judaism in various areas of conflict? Uh, is the second question again? First one or second one? The second. The second. Who attempted to interact with the active different streams of Judaism in various areas of conflict? Okay. Maybe would you like to ask Brian to uh, specify the question? Yeah, very okay, much. Okay, so the I second. will uh, allow Brian to... Uh, ask the question just give me a moment uh brian if you are with us we would love to hear a bit more from you about what you had in mind thank you very much um what i meant by my second question is did our progressive rabbi in this lecture was he active in the variety of streams from the various orthodox uh, variations uh, and other streams of Judaism such as existed. And I'm not familiar uh, that much of the other streams. Uh, and I don't know how diverse as we find in the U.S. But I can only imagine in that period in with folks in the big cities in urban environments, as you mentioned, Krakow, et cetera, that there would be um, uh, variations of, of what progressive Judaism was being um, expressed in from its roots in Germany. So I, my, my thought is whom in that community tried to diplomatically uh, keep uh, discussion so that the community is diverse and disparate as it was, he had a, a kind of unity when they did have to represent themselves in the parliament or other regions, uh, like under the Council of Four Lands. 
and the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now I understand, I hope. Well, for the first uh, uh, question, I have no idea about the percentage, but I think it's not much. It usually was, uh, uh, as I said, in big cities like Krakow and, and Warsaw, among the and intelligentsia that already went through a kind of acculturation. They needed the, uh, the, the sermons be in Polish. So they actually didn't know Hebrew, which was really a painful point for Tom. So I don't think it was a huge percentage. Most of, I can't say if most of the Jews were living in the countryside, but if there were about th three millions of Jews in Poland mm -hmm. and the biggest city was Warsaw with 300,000, so most of the Jews were living in the countryside, and I don't think they, they were aware to progressive Judaism because progressive Judaism is connected to, to, to Western ideas, modernization, and uh, education, higher education. So it's not, uh, it's not the Judaism that, was, uh, that Jews were familiar with in, in uh, shtetls, usually only those who went to the West to study. Uh, came across it. And as for the second question, uh, Ton at the beginning was not regarded uh, very highly by the Orthodox uh, uh, groups or Orthodox community in uh, um, Krakow. But because of his uh, unique uh, personality and because he was a person of compromise and understanding in getting into agreement. Uh, all his political, uh, religious also in Krakow, also his political, I mean, whole Jewish, you know, Poland, uh, activity was to unite the Jews and to, uh, and although there were, he was a representative of uh, Zionist um, uh, party in the parliament, but in the parliament, uh, other Jewish um, Parties like Aguda, I mean the party of the Orthodox, and uh, also might be also the Bund or kind of socialist uh, Jew, 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 Jews, and he wanted them all the time to. Come. That's why he was the president, uh, the president of the Jewish circle in the parliament because he thought that uh, mutual they have to uh, build mutual strategy to fight for the whole Polish Jews. Also, because of his background and because his great knowledge in 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 text, that was so much important for him. He tried to 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 tell it to his uh, flag that was actually much more acculturated than him, maybe assimilated than him. Uh, that you have to know the roots. You have to know Hebrew. You have to know the the, the Jewish canon, and only then go further with it. You can't. Uh, create something new if you don't have the tools of the past. So in all his political uh, activity, he was trying to make all the Jewish groups together to, to, to fight for, of, of course, uh, um, their human rights, their civil rights, but also what he never um, achieved, uh, the Jews will have a national autonomy in, in uh, Poland. Thank you very much. I know maybe this was an anecdote, but uh, when he died, almost all the Jews of Krakow and a lot of people from the Orthodox community uh, just joined the funeral. Um, uh, Professor Ronen, I'm going to ask one more question. There are many other questions that uh, are uh, being asked, but uh, our time is uh, almost over. I want to uh, um, invite uh, uh, Alan Isser uh, to ask his question. Um, his question uh, was tone aware of the ideas of modern Orthodox uh, thinkers like Samson Raphael Hirsch. Yes, of course. And he was, uh, he, he, when he, um, 
criticize orthodoxy as a kind of rejection or reaction to reform Judaism, he was meant this new orthodox, not the Hasidism of, of Poland. Yes, so of course he knew the ideas and he, he was not accepting them. Let us let I mean he was he was he criticized both because he wanted to find a place between them, orthodoxy and reform, but he, he was for sure not adherent of even what is called modern orthodox, because he, he, he really thought of of uh, uh of synthesis with European culture. And in Poland was something that I didn't mention. He helped the, the Jews, no, three, uh, four, uh, three millions of Jews in Poland. It was a great community. He really hoped that they will uh, create Jewish, uh, Jewish culture in Polish. I think his idea to uh, Polish Jews was a kind of what is going on with Jews in the United States. United States, they 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 create Jewish culture in 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 English today. This was his idea. Of course, nowadays it's impossible. There are no Jews in Poland, or very few Jews in Poland. No one to create a. Jewish uh, culture and Polish, but this was his idea. I, I want to thank you, um, Professor Ronen. Um, uh, we have just scratched the surface. I had the privilege of reading the book, A Prophet of Consolation on the Threshold of Destruction. It is a little hard to get this book, but it's available. And I think we need to get the publishers to make it more available. It is a fascinating book. Um, it answers in greater depth than is possible now um, the, the questions you ask and draws uh, an incredible picture of uh, this Renaissance teacher. Um, I have written in our publicity that uh, Ton is the equivalent um, and almost contemporary of Stephen S. Wise and Leo Beck, but more so because of his complex uh, involvements. And um, uh, Shoshana Ronen has done the Jewish people a great service by recovering uh, the story of his life. And she's continuing to write about him and many, many other topics. And we um, demand a return uh, visit um, uh, to our uh, Freighted Legacies uh, soon. We, we hope that we'll have many other opportunities uh, to learn from you. Uh, I want to turn to just a, a bit of the um, uh, a business that we have at hand in terms of uh, the uh, future of uh, our freighted legacies. Um, first of all, our, our community has um, been very concerned about the hostages. One of the hostages is especially one of our own, uh, Alex Danzig, and um, I have put in chat the link to the petition to the Polish government asking that they uh, make an effort to intervene on behalf of Alex Danzig, uh, who uh, sits uh, at the desk of Polish concerns at Yad Vashem and is a sometimes uh, a presence in our uh, Beit Polska uh, congregation, and uh, we have mobilized um, in in Warsaw, and I hope that people will take that link and use it uh, to contact um, uh, the Polish government and to be aware and concerned uh, for uh, uh, Alex Danzig's uh, welfare. I want to announce that um, our next um, speaker uh, will be uh, the uh, person uh, who is currently uh, going to be in Washington, D.C., Joanna Tokarska Bakir, whose book, Cursed, A Social Portrait of the Celts of Pogrom, has just been translated to English. I'm proud to say that 
Friends of Jewish Renewal, uh, was active in helping that book to come to its English um, translation. And her interlocutor uh, will be Jan Gross, uh, author of Neighbors. This program will be conducted, uh, except for the introduction by yours truly, will be conducted in Polish. And uh, we will listen to the English. Uh, many of us who are listening in English will listen to the Polish um, tr uh, transcription. So uh, we invite people to continue to be involved uh, with uh, these programs to be on our mailing list. Um, and uh, we uh, have a number of additional programs. Uh, we conclude today with uh, a reminder about the petition for Alex's uh, welfare and um, heartfelt thanks uh, to uh, Shoshana Ronen. And um, I wish everyone uh, a good evening and a good day. Shalom. Thank you so much. Thank Shalom. you.